In this video, we'll start moving towards finding a picture or a graph for functions, and we talk about the terms domain and range and allowable values for functions. Remember from one of the other videos that the function f of x equal to x squared minus 3x takes on the values of 4 at x equals minus 1, 0 at x equals 0, and minus 2 at x equals 1. So we have some values of the function given certain input values. Well, what if we add more of these values of f of x, like we have here in this, I'm going to call it for a moment, a function picture. f of minus 1 was 4, so you can see here at x equals minus 1, we have a value of 4 if we think of the function value as a height above the x-axis. At 0, it was 0, and at 1, it was minus 2. If we had some others, like x equals minus 2, which gives f equal to 10, and so on for these other dots, we start to get a bit of a picture of what this function looks like for the different possible values of x. What about if we add even more of them? Here's another picture, the same kind of picture with an x-axis. This time I've labelled the height as the f of x axis, or the function axis. You can see that more of these dots start to give us an even better picture of what that function might look like. A better picture. The little dots in the middle, sort of indicating that if we had even more again, we're starting to get some sort of almost a curve that represents our function f of x. Well, we're going to find that that's exactly what we can do. And we're going to start to formalise this idea of a picture of a function. And essentially how that picture is built up is by assigning the independent variable and its values to a horizontal number line. And we then, we say plot the corresponding dependent values or the values of the function as a height above or below that horizontal number line. And we associate with them their own vertical number line, as you've seen in the previous slide. Well, sometimes, for certain functions, the values of the independent and dependent variables are restricted. We can't just use any old values that we want. And a simple example that you're probably already familiar with is that if f of x was the function 1 over x, sure, we can, we can look at f of 2, that's just 1 over 2, or we could look at f of minus 1, 1 on minus 1. But we can't do 1 over 0, it's not defined. And so we have to talk about restricting the set of input variables or the set of x values that we can use for this function. And we're not allowed to use x equals 0. Another function, f of x equals to the square root of x. Well, of course, we can find the square root of 4 and 7 and 1,000, but we can't find the square root of negative numbers when we're talking about uh, real variables. So for f of x equal to the square root of x, we'd have to say that x needs to be greater than or equal to 0 in order to make the function uh, work in, a, in an okay kind of way. So it turns out that this is actually quite a common problem. We have to do this a lot and talk about restricting things. Sometimes we actually want to restrict things. So if we're talking about defining a function that represents something to do with time, we might only be interested in uh, time being zero or bigger. So we might intentionally restrict the set of possible independent variable values. We give this a name, we give this set of possible values uh, of the independent variable, we call that the domain of the function, the domain from uh, where we get the numbers from. On the other hand, the set of possible values that can come out of a function, the set which can be created, we call that the range of the function. So we get this terminology of domain and range, what we can put in and what we can get out of the function. And the, the example on the previous slide, f of x equal to 1 over x, x equals 0 was not allowed because we can't divide by 0, but every other real number is fine. So we can just call the domain of that function x not equal to 0. There's a few other ways you can write that as well. Here's another example. Given n of r, using some different letters, is r squared. Let's look. The independent variable is, of course, r, the one in the brackets. The dependent variable is the function name here, n. r can be, well, what can it be? Can we square zeros and negatives and positives? Yeah, we can, we can square any number we want. So r can be any real number. What about n? n is given by r squared. Well, it doesn't matter what we do, we're never going to get a negative value out of that. We can get a zero and we'll get positives. In fact, we can get any positive value, provided we choose r appropriately. So n can neg never be negative. 
So for the domain, we might write that R is between minus infinity and positive infinity. So we've introduced a couple of notations there. And the range we might write as, uh, let's say an n value, so n is greater than or equal to zero. So that's one way we might want to write the range and the domain for a function. Here's some examples. We're asked to de describe the domain and range of these three functions. Give yourself a moment now to try these out for yourself. Pop back to the previous slide to the other example if you'd like some guidance. Then come back and join me as I go through it. Okay, so the first example is g of x equal to x squared plus 2. Thinking about the possible x values we can put in there and not break any mathematical rules. Again, we're faced with a square of x and then adding 2 to it. Well, there's, there's no problem squaring any old x we want to, and we can certainly add 2 to the result. So again, the domain is going to be minus infinity, less than x is less than infinity. The range, on the other hand, is a little bit harder than the previous example. Previously, we had r squared, so the possible outputs were anything bigger than 0, and including 0. Here we've got this plus 2 on the end, and that effectively shif shifts things upwards by 2 units. So our range is going to be that g must be greater than or equal to 2. We can't get anything less than 2 here. In b, we've got y of t equal to 4 on 5 minus 2t. Now here, let's have a look at the domain. We, we have t values as our domain. So what we want to know is what t values would break this, this function. And essentially it would be broken if we had a 0 on the bottom. There's nothing much else that could go wrong. So 5 minus 2t equal to 0, we can solve that by rearranging and we'll get that t is equal to 5 on 2 or 2.5. So the domain is basically any t value you want as long as you don't have uh, 5 on 2 or 2.5. So here's another way that we could write that. We could say that uh, d is equal to any t that we want provided t is not equal to 5 on 2. Normally use a, a vertical line there. Okay, now in this case, I don't actually expect you to be able to graph this. You could go to something like Wolfram Alpha or any other plotting tool, and you'd find that this function looks something like this, getting closer and closer to zero, but never reaching it. And on this side, again, getting closer and closer to zero, but never reaching it. So it turns out that the range of this function is going to be any uh, y value that we want provided y is not equal to 0. So it's all the possible y's except for 0. All right, and finally, m of p is equal to the square root of p plus 1. Okay, we know that we can't find square roots of negative values. 0 and anything bigger is fine. So what we want to know is what is the p value that makes this part inside the square root equal to 0? Well, that would, of course, be p equal to minus 1. So anything less than minus 1 would cause us to be trying to find the square root of a negative, so we don't want that. So what we need to say is that the domain is all p-values given that p is greater than or equal to minus 1. Provided we've got that, everything's going to be okay, and we won't have any square roots of negatives. Now the, the plot of that function, again, I don't expect you to be able to do that one, but... I can tell you that that's going to look something like should look something like this, where that is p equal to minus one. Never goes below zero. It is equal to zero at p is minus one, and from then on just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So we can say that the range here it's going to be an m value. So it's m given that m is greater than or equal to zero, which you can basically see by looking at the picture. All right, so that's a few examples. Now, in this video, we've had a little bit of an introduction to the idea of a picture or a graph of a function, and we introduced these terms domain and range to talk about the allowable values of the input and the possible values of the output for a function.